but it's very soon here. Got it. Oh, let's make sure that's muted before I move off. Good. Live streaming. Judges. Just a couple more weeks for those of you who are like, oh, no more judges, please, for the love of Jesus. <laughs> It's been really good, as crazy as it is. Uh, it's fun to go into the things that uh, we might say uh, suck. So, they teach us things. <laughs> Looks like the Neen House's internet's down. We got about 30 seconds left. So get ready. We're going to be in Judges chapter 17. And we're going to read chapter 18 today because it's all kind of one story. And then after that, we only have three chapters left. And we should go through them fairly quickly, too. And the nice thing about being through them fairly quickly, too, is then we're done. <coughs> I need to ponder what we might do next, post-Easter. Did you get any input between Mark or Genesis? Or whatever else? No, nobody let me know anything. That's fine. It's, uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's better just to choose myself. But I am not going to do something terrible. That much I can promise. Hey, it's OK. <laughs> I, well, I mean, we've done some of the worst. I don't really know what kind of is on the level of Judges and Revelation, to be totally honest. Um, I don't want to do Joshua, because that would be like going back in time, and I don't, I don't much like Joshua, but I, I could probably learn a lot from it. Anyway, it's six o'clock. Let's pray. And, um, and if you have your Bibles, open them to Judges 17. And if you don't have your Bibles, go get one. And open it to Judge 17. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, as we comfortably sit in our homes with the comforts that we have that many of our ancestors couldn't comprehend, remind us of our blessedness so that we don't fail to see how glorious our existence gets to be, that we in fact are blessed to be a blessing. And as we examine one of the least known stories of judges, I don't know what you might have us see because quite frankly, there's not much there that is good. But in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the horrible, show us how you move so that in our own world where we see those who do not share our blessings and their struggles, as we see tyrants do their worst, we might see you there too. May it be done in accordance with your grace and your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So no more Samson. We've done a couple of weeks of Samson. He's behind us dead. And, uh, and, and, and we will not hear of another judge in the book of Judges because there are no more judges in the book of Judges. There's just terrible stories. And what do we know of the judges? The judges were all um, called by God, if you will, or however else, to, uh, to deliver the people from 
who or whom? Philistines. Philistines. Could be Philistines, could be Ammonites mm. or Amorites or Moabites or whatever else uh, from some kind of foreign uh, power. And if you've been with me this whole time, who do I keep referencing? Uh, let me try this again. Are the people that they're having to be delivered from evil because God hates people who aren't Israelites? No. Mm -hmm. Why Why doesn't God want them interacting with these people? And why um, do they need to be delivered from them? He wants them to follow him. Yeah. And what happens when you start following other people? You go astray. You lose your way. Yeah. And you can't follow. Uh, as Jesus said aptly, you cannot serve two masters. Um, uh, Bob Dylan sang a song about that when he was in his born again phase as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> but only one of them won a Nobel Prize and it wasn't Jesus. So, anyhow, um, we aren't going to see the people fight any foreign invaders or uh, those who are trying to persecute them from the outside anymore in the next five chapters of Judges. But they're going to be fighting. And so we know then that they're going to be fighting each other. And one of the problems that always happens when we have situations whereby we are trying to lash on to the cultures of death, to have our cake and eat it too, if you will, is not just that it pollutes our own spirituality, but it also causes us to rip each other apart. And we're going to see the first of two stories of that today in these two chapters. We're going to read both chapter 17 and 18. And then next week, again, I offer just this. Next week, we're going to read Judges 19. Uh, Judges 19, in my opinion, is the worst story in the Bible. Um, and that's saying something because there's some pretty terrible stories in the Bible. But uh, and I, I just want you to be ready for it. Um, it's, it's, it's ugly. It's terrible. It's traumatic. It may trigger uh, feelings in you. And if you've experienced violence, uh, especially uh, if you're a woman, um, Judges 19 is, uh, well, it's tragic. But we're going to begin to see some of the tragedy now. And um, again, before we do this and we're wondering why is this in the Bible? Why it is this? This is a prophetic text that reminds us what happens when we do not follow God. Um, Jesus says things a little bit more lightly and because we believe uh, much like the Israelites of old that God is our God and God won't let us go. Uh, that doesn't mean that our actions will not cause incredible pain. And this is what happens when we let our desires for our selfish impulses uh, to do what's right in our own eyes. Um, well, we're going to see. So starting off on Judges chapter 17, hopefully we have our, uh, uh, our Bibles. We have a different translations. The, the chapter 17 is not very long. Uh, chapter 18, neither is it very long, but a little bit longer. So uh, anyone have any desire to read chapter 17, verse 1 through verse 6? I'll do it. Thank you. There was a man in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. He said to his mother, the 1100 pieces of silver that were taken from you about which you uttered a curse and even spoke it in my hearing, that silver is in my possession. I took it, but now I will return it to you. And his mother said, may my son be blessed by the Lord. 
Then he returned the 1100 pieces of silver to his mother and his mother said, I consecrate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make an idol of cast metal. I'm gonna interrupt you, Michelle, just for a second. As we hear the story at the beginning, are you having any red flags? Idol. Idol, there's an <laughs> idol going on there. Um, and, and, and did you notice that it starts with Micah saying, oh, I heard you like basically utter a curse to someone who stole your 1100 pieces of silver. By the way, that was me, here they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, and she was like, praise be to the Lord for you, uh, the, this God, Adonai. And, uh, and, and now I consecrate this to Adonai, make him idol with it. So we're already seeing how quickly they begin to break some of the commandments. All right, thank you very much, if, Michelle. You, if, please. Um, if, if this person is not a Philistine, the mother, and the 1100 uh, shekels or silver, is equal to what the Philistines in the last chapter said, we'll give Delilah, each one of us will give, they must have stolen the money to begin with <clears throat> from an Israelite and gave it away. Steve, again, well done. Yes, I was pondering if anybody might remember that the Philistines gave 1,100 pieces of silver to Delilah for betraying Samson. We'll talk about that in slides that we may or may not get to. but. Uh, and, and in this piece too is, uh, yeah, that 1100 is symbolic, of course. I, I mean, it's to remind us of the story that we just read. And the 1100 pieces of silver that were for Delilah was to betray Samson. And so if you hear 1100, just a chapter later of 1100 pieces of silver again, and that was for betrayal and bad things. As soon as you hear 1100 pieces of silver again, you should immediately if you remember any of your English classes in high school, you should be immediately being like, this is bad. Like, <laughs> th there's a connection. Now, um, strangely, um, never is Delilah mentioned explicitly to be a Philistine. Um, so there are some commentators who ponder if Micah's mother is in fact Delilah, but mm. uh, to me, it seems quite clear that Delilah is, in fact, a Philistine woman. And so this unnamed mother of Micah is, is not. Um, it's just the same part of the amount of silver used in just an effort to remind us of this theme of the progressive deterioration. But whereas initially it was used to betray Samson, who was a bad judge, to some degree now it's being used to betray God. And that's a different kind of thing. And now it's not being done by a foreign power. It's being done by the people of God. Because this whole thing of stealing from his mother, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then giving it back, but using part of it to make an idol is part of what's going on. But nicely, nicely caught there, Steve. Do you reread these things? A little. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Because I, I'll be honest, when I read it initially, I didn't catch that. So that when you said that so quickly, it was bad enough when you said that piece about Revelation asking if Judas' name was one of the 12 written on that thing. But now you're asking questions that I didn't ask on my first reading. And that, so uh, maybe you should uh, start studying some more. You can teach one of these books. Oh. <laughs> no, I, amen. Maybe so. All right. All right. Uh, four, five, Mommy. and six, Michelle. Okay. Good. All right. So when he returned the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into an idol of cast metal. And it was in the house of Micah. This man Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod and teraphim and installed one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. Whew. Okay, so we are six verses into the time of no judges. And we have an odd story. Um, so anyone want to 
talk about what's happened a little? What do you see going on here? That's already issues. It's kind of like a free for all. If they don't have a king, everyone's creating their own false idols. And Ama has that piece about the king and we'll read that there was no king in Israel at those times a couple of times. And there's a lot of commentators, especially past commentators, who believe that these stories are referencing the, the need for a king. Except simultaneously, what do we know about the kings of Israel and Judah? Are they positive influences? No. 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 And so while there's no king in Israel and everyone's doing right in their own eyes, I ponder if it's not also a foreshadowing for just how it was when the kings came in anyway. Um, so we say that no king in Israel, but uh, the piece then that's important is, is the, as you said, is the people are doing what's right in their yeah, own eyes. In their eyes, which has everything to do, again, since we've already hearkened back to Samson, this is the second time we're hearkening back to Samson because Samson had already said that she looks right in my own eyes, speaking of the Philistine woman who became his wife. And so it has this kind of notion that people no longer, so let's try this instead. Um, what happens when you don't pay any attention to the divine will for your life? If you don't spend any time trying to figure out what God wants of you, um, how often do we go about doing whatever feels right in our own eyes? And, uh, and, and, and that means so many different pieces. Now, simultaneously, can anyone tell how many commandments have been broken in the first seven, six verses of Judges chapter 17? At least three. <laughs> Uh, there's certainly at least three, um, and, 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 and we can name some of them right away. You shall have no other gods before me. Oops. Do not make graven images. Oops. Yeah. Do not steal. Don't steal. steal. Oops. Honor, your, about, your, honor your, father your father and mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were saying, Ted? Yes. Yeah. So that's four. Someone had to covet these things. That's five. We're talking about at least five. And let's not to mention using the Lord's name in vain because she was like, praise be to Adonai for you. And then why don't you make an image? So we're speaking six of the 10 at least broken. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. I, I have a question about idols, and I hope I'm not going down a sidetrack here. However, um, I'm really listening to what you're saying. And, um, and I'm thinking, giving everybody full credit here, you know, um, when something happens, or you want a memento, or you want um, an image or whatever, I, I, I can see people, me being inclined to you want an image, you want a, a graven image, but maybe God's saying, don't turn that into something that you worship. Because, um, you know, I, I think of like statue, I think of a cemetery. I mean, you, you want these things and I can see that desire in these people's hearts. Um, but I think there's like a turning point where an idol, you know, you go away from the literal word, don't make graven images, but then you make a graven image and it turns into a god. Um, so I'm kind of going back and forth in my mind. It's kind of like bugging me. Can you shed any light on that, please? Um, I think it a, a, has a lot to do with intentionality. Let's pay attention to the Micah story and what he did here. Okay. Um, he makes an idol and then he makes an ephod and he makes a teraphim. Now, what the ephod or ephod. And so he makes a shrine uh -huh. and he, he makes an e e ephod. And the ephod is something that um, uh, it has many kind of meanings, okay. but the, the priest in uh, 
so when Moses received the, the commandments from God on how to establish the priesthood, the priesthood had to have a, uh, an, an ephod um, that was something that covered them. It was kind of like a breastplate and, and from which they did things like divination. And, um, and, and so strangely, many, many thousands of years ago, um, they would have pieces of this that helped them discern the will of God. And we have references of Saul and David both using the priests to have some kind of divination in an effort to understand God's will. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was the ephod, but that's a part of the priestly garments that come out of Exodus and again in Leviticus. Um, the, uh, the, the, the teraphim here is, it's, and it's in the plural teraphim. I actually think uh, Michelle pronounced that better than I just did. Um, we don't know the etymology of the word teraphim in, uh, in Hebrew. We know that it was basically used as a reference to household god idols. Um, so what we see Micah doing with this 200 pieces of silver mm -hmm. is he, he makes a shrine. And, okay. he, he, and so what happens at a shrine, Grace? Well, you establish a shrine to focus um, your thoughts and your, your prayers, and, um, and, and hopefully that's what it's about. <laughs> and, and amen. And yeah, like, I mean, some might say, my wife included, that what's behind, oh, you can't really see it, and that's all right. Um, well, here, I'm just going to go like this. Like, you see how there's all that kind of stuff over there or something? Like, people yeah. walk into my room and they're like, is that a shrine? And we're like, sure. Um, but I'm, I'm not, even if I utilize those pieces to help, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, establish? Not establish. Um, oh. I'm going to use the word enhanced, even though it's not the word I want to use, uh, okay. to, to help enhance <laughs> my worship. Um, so again, I like to carry around a uh, rosary. Um, I, yeah. I was a little dismayed when I didn't have it in a pocket, but I changed my, my coat before here. And, and that rosary, is, is it an idol? I mean, there's some Protestants who would say so, okay. but no, it's just something, amen, and uh, neither will I. Um, and it's just a, uh, it's a means with which I am reminded of my God. And so like the, the Eastern yeah. Orthodox traditions have icons and on the iconor, iconor, iconography of the Eastern, has anyone ever been to an Orthodox church, whether it be Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or Coptic? Yeah. When you go into those churches, what is it like when you see the wall? It's covered with, with saints and um, covered. Images. Yeah. Do you get the sense that they are worshiping any of those saints of those icons? No, you're you're surrounded or embraced by it, but you're you're not you're not you're not bowing to them. No. Well, now, yeah. what okay. he's doing here, though, okay. is not just is he creating a shrine, but an ephod and a teraphim to boot is actually creating out little idols that you are, are bowing down to worship him. Now, part of the reason the Old Testament laws say you shall not make any idols and engraven images, because God does not want to be represented by engraven images, because what happens if we try to represent God by something that we can create? It's too small. It's always too small. Yeah. yeah. image. And it's in our image. Or, for instance, when the Israelites or the Hebrews in the wilderness, while Moses was on Sinai getting the Ten Commandments, what image did they make? Calf. A calf. Yeah. Or, or so the idea is going, in kind of an oxen kind of mentality. Um, and uh, in the ancient world, almost all ancient peoples had as some kind of god an ox, a calf of an ox or something of that nature. Now, if you're an ancient person and you imagine going to some kind of place where there's very little food, how do you go about at the beginning of the agricultural age developing food sources that began what we might call the urban movement of society? 
That was a big question. Maybe I should stop asking questions and just tell you what I'm trying to say. <laughs> when ancient humanity was becoming urbanized, which means they stopped being hunter gatherers and like nomadic people, but now began to coalesce into villages and towns. The thing they needed most in an effort to do that was agriculture. Because without agriculture, you're not going to have enough food for having a community of people who are together like that. Now, we live in a very agricultural area. And, 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 and I will look out there sometimes. And, and when they're trying to plow the fields and plant new things, what are they using? Tractors, tools, machines. Tractors, tools, machines. The ancients didn't have tractors, tools, or machines. What did they have? Oxen. They had oxen and no. oxen were a massive. Now imagine if, if you're an ancient person, you see this barren wasteland. There is no way on God's green earth that you are going to be able to, to satisfy the, the needs of a whole community unless you can build the agricultural system with which to support them. But you can't even do that with the human power that was necessary. But once you began to develop the technology to build a plow, you had something, but you needed something to pull the plow. Oh. And there is only a handful of mammals in the world that are big enough that you can do that. Now, wow. more importantly is not only is there a handful of mammals that can do that, it has to be a mammal because you know, it's just the, that's the way of things. Um, there's only a smaller handful that you can actually train to do that. You can't get an elephant to do it. You might be able to train an elephant to do it, but it'll take years. It doesn't take you long to train an ox at all. So ancient peoples saw something like an oxen as something that could take land that was barren and from it, life springs forth, food springs forth, agriculture springs forth, communities spring forth, cities spring forth. This is miraculous. So we shouldn't have any surprise that all ancient peoples, and well, not all, but almost all ancient peoples of ancient cultures had among their pantheon of gods, a God that was in the image of a calf, of an ox. Oh my gosh. I can't believe this. I, that's a, what an amazing I thought. I had no idea. Well, amen. I'm, I'm really glad that it's, it's a guy to mind blow you a little bit because yeah. what a brilliant thing. Um, and so, so they did that with the ox, but the problem is, now this is the biggest problem. The ox can do this, Grace. Yeah. But who has control over the ox? The, per the, the man, the person. Exactly. The oh. Yeah. So anytime they started making things in other images, it was often a domesticated beast. Yeah. And we have a wild God. Um. And God does not want nor will God allow God's self to be domesticated. <laughs> huh. We don't get power over God. And so God has no desires for engraven images because that's us trying to have power over God. Now, Protestants lost their minds 500 years ago by talking about how the Catholics had all of these idols. And, and, and you go into Catholic churches and there's, there's statues of things. And do people pray to the statues? No, they pray with the statue in front of them, but they are praying to God. Now, they might also pray to saints, and Protestants have something to say about that as well. But the, the speaking to the ancestors is more ancient than any of our known religions. Mm -hmm. And I would hazard a guess that many Protestants have attempted to speak to their ancestors as well and don't feel like they're suddenly going to H-E double hockey sticks because of it. Okay. What Micah is doing, however, in this story, he stole money. His mom curses whoever stole it. And he heard it. And he's like, oh, I heard you utter this curse. Here's your money back. And she's like, oh, praise be to 
the Lord, she's praising the right God. And bless you in God's name. And here's $200 or 200 silver pieces. Make an idol. What? <laughs> she's praising the divine name without any need of an idol. But now she needs the idol. Why does she want the idol? Who knows? So he but can't steal the money again. Yeah, maybe because he can't. Yeah. All of all of my silver is made up in an idol now. You can't steal it. It's too big. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Um, <laughs> but he makes a shrine. He makes an ephod, which is another piece that's almost an idolatrous piece. <laughs> he makes a teraphim, which is probably the idol that was the actual thing it's more of a household god kind of piece it's what um rachel steals from her from her uh, father's house when her and jacob and leah and all the kids leave they go back to the holy land she steals all of this teraphim and uh and and that's what she sits on and says that she's having her menstrual cycle when her father comes looking for them all um it's a brilliant story and uh and, and so but he also installs one of his own sons who became his priest he sets up his own religion mm. now since i'm obviously not going to get to all of my slides tonight and we're just going to play with this story <laughs> in like this if this is okay if, if you want to go through the slides i will send them out along with the last ones as soon as we're done but Anyone happen to know what the name Micah means in Hebrew? No. I mean, if you did, that would be something. It's in my Bible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who okay. is like the Lord? Who is like Yah? Way. Well, the way is actually kind of there, but it's like, who is like Yah? Uh, who is like the Lord? Micah. And the irony in the book of Judges by this point in time is that the name Micah means who is like the Lord. And Micah is the one acting like the Lord. Hmm. And you will also notice that there are no other people named in this story outside of Micah which is part of the narrator's way of making an ironic use of the name Micah and demonstrating that the lack of names is, uh, is, is, is demonstrative of everyone has just become terrible. Wow. And so by it saying after these five verses that everyone's doing right in their own eyes, we're reminded that we can count just ourselves, not like off the top of our head, at least six of the Ten Commandments that have been broken in the first five verses of this chapter. Yeah. Now, another Nepot reason I don't think, I'm sorry, Gary, what were you saying? No, I was, and nepotism on top of it. Yeah, nepotism <laughs> on top of it. You get to be my priest. Um, yeah. And, and, and one other piece here too, uh, and Winnie, you noticed too, the piece where about there's there was before this was kings in Israel. Um, and, and some people will even say that this is not just um, supporting the monarchy, but supporting the Davidic like line of the monarchy. Um, and we'll get into reasons why um, uh, the tribe of Benjamin is treated terribly um, uh, and, and is looked down upon. And that's where uh, Saul comes from. But uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's not pro monarchy and it's not pro David. Um, anyone remember how many commandments David broke in a single day? No, ten, at least oh. six. <laughs> and that's the brilliance of it. This is a foreshadowing to how terrible even the monarchy is where everyone keeps doing what's right in their own eyes. And as we talk about this book, as we've talked about this book together, we can say, why does this 3000 year old story have any bearing to reality today? Have you noticed in your own living or the lives of others that you witness that 
everyone seems to be doing what's right in their own eyes. Yeah. Yes. Have you noticed how we will stop following Jesus who is the Christ and create images of who Jesus is so that we don't have to deal with the dangerous things Jesus says? Have you noticed that we no longer care about institutional churches and anyone who feels like they've been called by God can open up the Church of Jesus Christ of Garrett Andrew and make their own shrine and set up whomever they want to be a priest or pastor as long as that priest or pastor says what they want. Yeah. The reason judges is important is because we're still living it. All right. The um, Gideon did the exact same thing after he kind of assumed power. He built one of these ephods. Yes, he did. Steve, I want your notes for whatever book that we're doing next. <laughs> I think that'll be... Um, and uh, no, and Gideon is the beginning of the progressive deterioration of the people of Israel. Um, they were already kind of well on their way, but Gideon is especially bad. Um, and uh, it, because he's the first one who sets up an idol. And then you have Jephthah sacrificing his daughter to a God who doesn't want any human sacrifice. And then you have Samson who is embracing all the other cultures while never delivering the people. And now you don't have any judges, but you have the story of a guy named Micah which is an ironic twist about like the greatness of God only get to get to the place of I'm going to start my own religion. So we have again, idolatry and selfish ambition. And what have we discovered in the Bible, but particularly the book of judges, since we're in it, what happens when you have idolatry mixed with selfish ambition? Destruction. Great, let's read about it. Any, anyone want to finish up chapter 17? Um, and then and then the real destruction starts in chapter 18. But we'll let's finish up chapter 17. I'll try. <clears throat> now there was a young man I of froze. Ben you froze? I froze. Who froze. Oh, there you are. Okay. I was like, I'm gone for a second. Was anyone reading chapter 17 there for a moment or not? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Two words. <laughs> um, we'll start again. Chapter seven, right? Now there was a verse young seven. Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Verse, verse seven. seven. Verse seven. Now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judea of the family of Judah. I didn't say that right. Judah, sorry, <laughs> who was a Levite. And he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to live where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, from where do you come? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you 10 pieces of silver a year and a suit of apparel and your living. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as priest. Wow. wow. Okay. Now, <laughs> we need to know a lot of Old Testament to figure out pieces of what's going on here, of course. Levites. What are Levites? Who are Levites? Anybody know? They're the priests. They're the priestly class. They are one of the 12 tribes or 13 tribes. If you break up uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, which is Joseph. But Levi, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, his descendants got to be the priestly class. How does the priestly class supposed to survive according to Leviticus, if you remember that? And Steve, I might think that you do if you have your Leviticus notes. <laughs> Um, there were to be 
cities yeah, in which the Levites lived and also they were to have functions in local shrines of each of the places. This is a wandering Levite without a home. What does that teach us right away? Probably not religious. Not, not genuine or something. Maybe not genuine. Maybe not the greatest. Whatever is going on, nothing's happening the way that it's supposed to. You have an itinerant Levite looking for a place where apparently he'll stop wherever anybody gives him the most money. And Micah says, I'll give you 10 pieces of silver a year, a new set of clothes and et cetera, et cetera. And, and the Levite is like, sweet, I'll stop here. I'll stop my sojourning and I have a place. And now again, for the second time, Micah installed the Levite as priest of his own shrine notice what it says here too in verse 12 so micah installed the levite and the young man became his priest and was in the house of micah he was installed as a priest for the house of micah what house are priests supposed to serve god's house god's house the house of god <clears throat> We've gone down now where this character, Micah, who's appeared out of left field. We know him initially as a what? Thief. He's a thief. <laughs> and who's he steal from? His mother. <laughs> okay, so if you have a thief stealing from his mother, on, on, on what kind of totem pole of awesomeness do you place Micah? Like down toward the down toward the bottom. So Micah's not a good guy. And his mother, you know, like, oh, thanks for giving it back. Here's 200. Let's build some kind of idols. And he builds something. And first he names his son, a little bit of nepotism, but this kind of thing. He's obviously trying to create something whereby he doesn't have to worry about anything. But the joy of it is you have a wandering Levite. So already the religion at that time is disappearing and falling apart. And the wandering Levite is happy to take a role as a priest in the house of Micah. And Micah seems to think from that, now that I have a Levite, and now he brings up God again. The capital L-O-R-D. I know that God will prosper me. The Lord will prosper me. Why does he think the Lord will prosper him? Because he's doing what's right? Because he's supposed to be doing those things? Or because he has a Levite? A Levite. A Levite. He's got an ace in the hole, as they say, and he thinks he's set and he's good to go. And he can buy anything. And he can buy anything. He's got 1,100 pieces of silver, maybe, yeah. uh, from Delilah. Um, and again, keyword however, might be my. Next to the last word, he says, my priest. My priest, not God's priest, my priest. Good call on that, too. This is only selfish. This is only idle. And even though he thinks the Lord is going to bless him, we'll find out very soon that that's not going to happen. Notice again, though, how easy we can read this and not really see other than he stole from his mom and he made an idol. But yeah, maybe he's just making kind of pieces of things. He keeps using God's name. But that's part of the problem of using God's name. Just because people say Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior does not mean that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. All right. Okay, we're, yeah, we're not even getting the slides. We're reading this the slow way. <laughs> Got to get through. Got to get through 18 today. Uh, Whitney, you have to leave at 7 o'clock. Is that one of those things? No, I'm here extra today. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Let's and read 18. Interesting with where we started 17, I thought this was going to be a foreshadowing of the prodigal son, but it's definitely diverged off of that. <laughs> there, there ain't no prodigal here, Ted. No, no but I mean, it's, it's almost... 
I could see where it could have been, and then it really went away. <laughs> and it does. It has that kind of piece, like, oh, I welcome you back kind of thing. No, and it just goes off the rails. <laughs> um, I, I like that. Okay, anyone want to read uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 6? Mm -hmm. I can. Thank you. In those days, Israel had no king. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking a place of their own where they might settle because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Sorry, Israel. So the Danites sent five warriors from Zorah and Eshtol to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all their clans. They told them, go explore the land. The men entered the hill country of the Ephraim and came to the house of Micah where they spent the night. When they were near Micah's house, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. So they turned in there and asked him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them that Micah had done for him. He told them what Micah had done for him. He has hired me and I am his priest. Then they said to him, please inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. The priest answered, go in peace. Your journey has the Lord's approval. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. The Danites, the tribe of Dan. Um, it's convoluted from the Joshua story, and that's all right. Welcome to the Bible. It's convoluted sometime. It's con it is contradictory. If you don't realize that, please read it. Um, and if you want to find out that it's not in some kind of way to make yourself feel comfortable, build a bridge and get over your ego. Uh, God gets to be a mystery. Um, the Danites, though, never got to their land and stayed there and so now they're wandering and they're going through things and they're actually following the exact same path that the israelites follow in numbers 13 so it's hearkening back to earlier stories of the whole group of israel traveling around now do you remember in numbers 13 when moses sent spies into the promised land to check out the promised land and see what was going on. Yeah. Do you remember what those spies said when they came back? There's giants. There's giants. And basically, we're not going to be able to do this. We need the Lord's help. Yeah. Okay. So at least they got to the place of they need the Lord's help or, or that kind of piece, even though they didn't quite get it initially. And they had to wander around for 40 years and let everybody die before they got there. But... There was that kind of notion. So you're supposed to read this and be like, okay, so now the Danites are wandering, still looking for a place. But the Danites are one of the 12 tribes. And they're going into Ephraim, which is also one of the 12 tribes, looking for a place. So they're not settling where they were uh, supposed to. And they're looking to settle in other kind of places. And we haven't seen any foreign power at all. And they send spies into the land. And their spies happen to recognize a wandering Levite. And, and, and the Levite says, yeah, no, he's hired him, me to be his, his priest. And that's the kind of thing. And so, but they're just excited to see a priest because now they want to know if it's going to work out for them. Uh, so inquire of God that we may know if our mission will be undertaken, will succeed. You get any sense that this priest, this Levite, this wandering itinerant preacher who is up for the highest bidder has any notion of what God is actually doing? No. 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 And so he says, go in peace. The mission you are on is under the eye of the Lord, which by the way, he never answers their actual question. He just is like, go in peace. God is watching over you. <laughs> this is going to work so well. All right. So verse seven in chapter 18 i'm actually just going to read and interrupt myself as i'd like for these next 13 minutes since uh, oh, kathy brady i am so happy to see your face by the way um we're talking about a man named micah who who, 
who of course sucks because we're in, in judges, but uh, it's not been so bad so far. He stole from his mom, uh, stole 1,100 pieces of silver, which is the same amount of silver that Delilah got from the Philistines. That's symbolic, of course. Um, his mom cursed everybody because it was gone. He heard the curse, gave back the stuff. His mom was so grateful that she gave him 200 pieces of silver with which he built an idol, a, a whole kind of thing, and then named his son as a priest in his own household and then found a wandering Levite who should never be wandering in the first place because Levites were supposed to have special towns and do special functions. And he's not doing anything that he's supposed to, but is hired by this guy, Micah, to be his own personal priest in the house of Micah. And now the Danites are wandering around looking for land. That's just, wow, there we go. This is 30 seconds. Thanks for the update. I had an internet outage. So that's my and just got on. Amen. And, and uh, the Neen House has had one as well. And I went dead for a second. So I think the storms are knocking us all around. So again, now these five spies. The five men went on. And when they came to Laish, they observed the people who were there living securely. The word securely in Hebrew there has the same root as the word rest. Why do I mention that to you? What happened when the judges did what they were supposed to be doing? Land rested. The land rested. The people had rest. Rest is good. Let rest is what God wills. The people in Laish here are secure. They're living securely. They're resting. This is supposed to be for any one of us who speaks Hebrew, which is none of us. But if you're reading this in the initial language, you know that the people here in the tribe of Ephraim are living as God intends. So they notice these people are living securely after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting. Unsuspecting is that same root for the word rest. Again, why do I mention any of this? They're the ones living the way God intends, lacking nothing on earth and possessing wealth. Furthermore, they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with Aram. When they came to their kinsfolk at Zora and Eshtel, they said to them, what do you report? They said, come, let us go up against them for we have seen the land and it's very good. Will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, but enter in and possess the land. When you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. There's that same root for rest. The land is broad. God has indeed given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything on earth. They found paradise where people are living as God wants. 600 men of the Danite clan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zora and Eshtael and went up and encamped mm -hmm. at Kiriath Jerim in Judah. On this account, that place is called Mahanedan to this day. It is west of Kiriath Jerim. Jiar That's hard for me to say. From there, they passed on to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone out to spy the land that is Laish said to their comrades, do you know that in these buildings there are an ephod, teraphim, and an idol cast of metal? Ooh. Notice the idol cast of metal really gets in them. Why is an idol cast of metal more interesting than an idol of something else? Gold or silver. Gold or silver. And, and it, versus wood. And we all know gold or silver is, is it's shinier than wood. <laughs> um, so they turned in that direction and came to the house of the young Levite, the one who blessed them, at the home of Micah and greeted him. While the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood at the entrance of the gate, the five men who had gone to spy out the land proceeded to enter and take the idol cast of metal, the ephod, and the teraphim. The priest was standing by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. Wait a sec. Where's the priest standing? Is he with Micah and his household anymore? No. He's with the Why? Better deal. 
<laughs> he got a better deal. That's exactly right. Oh, Be careful if you get a priest who just likes to like, I'll go anywhere where the money's good. <laughs> You know, like it's uh, I, 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 there was a story I heard about myself uh, and it's something years ago when when people thought I was going to be something that I glad I never became. And uh, anyone remember Lloyd Ogilvy? Oh, yeah, he, okay. he was the, the, the pastor at first Hollywood and it was on he had his own television show. He was the chaplain of the Senate for a while, too. Yeah. And in 96 was named one of the 12 most effective preachers in the English speaking language. And he came out to speak somewhere in the Presbytery I was at the time. And, and, and so the story goes, the people who were there, he was talking about me to someone at a different church. And the person at the different church said, yes, no, he's very good. Um, but he's very committed to this spot. And, and Ogilvy was like, How's the, how do you know that? And he's like, well, he got a call to a congregation of 2,000 members to be their head of staff, and he turned it down to stay in Albany, Georgia. And I was like, what are those stories coming up with? Like, I mean, at the time in my life, if somebody had told me that I was going to be at a church that big, I'd be like, I'm going to go upstairs and pray. Melinda, you stay downstairs and pack. And, um, <laughs> and, and I feel like at that time, I was a little bit like this Levite. So he's just immediately with the men there. And when the men went to Micah's house and took the idol cast out, what are you? And, and Micah says to them, what are you doing? And the priest said to them, what are you doing? And they said to him, keep quiet, put your hand over your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest. It is better for you to be a priest in the house of one. Is it better for you to be a house of the priest of one person or a priest to a tribe in a clan of Israel? So then the priest accepted the offer. He took the ephod and the teraphim and the idol and went along with the people. Did they use the metal in the idol to have wealth? It was their security, their God. They took the idol and apparently took the priest so they can go along worshiping it. Mm. This is not going well. Mm. Verse 21, so they resumed their journey, putting the little ones, what are they doing? The little ones, the They're livestock, children. and the goods in front of them. Pillaging barrier. Yep. When they were some distance from the house of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out. And they overtook the Danites. They shouted to the Danites who turned around and said to Micah, what is the matter that you come with such a company? He replied, you take my gods that I made. <laughs> made. <laughs> Amen. And the priest and go away. And what have I left? How then can you ask me what is the matter? And the Danites said to him, you had better not let your voice be heard among us or else hot-tempered fellows will attack you and you will lose your life and the lives of your household. The Danites now have twice, once to the priest, once to Micah, said, shut up or we'll kill you. Notice what Micah is upset about. The God that I made. Can you ever lose God? No. No. People of profound inner peace who know this, know that their connection is to the divine and the divine is within them in all things. When they have things taken from them, when their livelihoods are destroyed, how do they maintain their inner peace? They do so because they know who they are and who it is that holds them. Okay. Micah. Can people lose God? Back to your question. I mean, um, people can stop seeing God. Uh, okay, okay. I mean, does that make sense? Like, you can't misplace God. Well, yeah, he, he's there. The, yeah, that, that's what it means to lose, though. Like, oh, okay. uh, where, where'd God go? I mean, you might be blind, but that doesn't mean that God isn't there. Okay, got it. Okay, sorry. Thank you. No, and amen, though, be some people are like, I lost God. No, you didn't. You just need to, again, 
there's a song lyric I like, and, and please be true of this with me. If I ever stop seeing the magic all around me, please take my hands off my eyes. Uh. Like there is some truth to that. Magic is all around you, miracles all around you. Micah has lost his magic, <laughs> lost his miracle because <laughs> as he says, yeah. you take my gods that I made. What are the gods that we make today? Money. Technology. Technology. <laughs> Security. Technology is a form of magic. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it makes us very easy <laughs> to do all sorts of things. We don't have to work hard for stuff anymore. Um, we don't recognize the kind of difficulty that people of the past used to recognize. What happens if someone took away our technology? Mm. Uh we'd be here <laughs> we'd be we wouldn't know what to do yeah we would follow along after we're robbed and pillaged wondering what's this while they tell us what's the matter and then again by the time we get to here after the danites now threatened micah and his household then the danites went their way when micah saw that they were too strong for him he turned and went back to his home. The Danites, having taken what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him, came to Laish to a people quiet and unsuspecting. That means rest again. This is also another tribe of Israel, another clan. They put them to the sword and burned down the city. There was no deliverer because it was far away from Sidon and they had no dealings with Aram. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. They rebuilt the city and lived in it. They named the city Dan after the ancestor Dan who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was formerly Laish. That the Danites set up the idol for themselves. Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the time the land went into captivity. So they maintained as their own Micah's idol that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Mm -hmm. I have a question. When they go take over all these cities, especially Laish saying like it's a peaceful place, the people are peaceful, why can't they just go move in instead of having to burn down the city and then rebuild it? Because they don't want to. <laughs> um, like it's, it's what happens when you stop like following this sense of God, um, this divine will to, to have justice and shalom. They aren't following God. They stole the idol from Michael, Micah. And when they were done with the whole conquering bit, did you notice that they set up the idol and worship the idol? Mm -hmm. They were never following God. They actually kept the God that Micah made in the area where they kind of did all of that. And did you notice who was the priest for what they set up? Not Luke just the priest. Levite. Believe it. Yeah. Not just the Levite, but here, let's go. Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons. This is Moses' grandson and great-grandsons now. Ooh. What do you think is the symbol that the editors and the authors of Judges is trying to teach us by suddenly incorporating Moses' name? Life has gone to a double hockey stick. Yeah. <laughs> the very one who gave them. Go wrong. Yeah. Yeah, the very one who gave them the law, or through whom came the law. Right. The very right. one who delivered them from Egypt. Now his own descendants are worshiping idols 
as priests and helping others go about doing that. So in yeah. a fascinating way, I'm sorry, did, did someone say something? I heard? I, I, just, just a thought, what bothers me is the people that are resting in the Lord, is the Old Testament saying that they're they're vulnerable? I mean, it's- No, it no, no. Like, okay, go ahead. It, it does sound yeah. like they're vulnerable and they are vulnerable. So that's all true. They, these are vulnerable people. There is a symbolism that's at play. Okay. And, 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 and Judges is, a, is, is full of symbolism. It's a very symbolic book. Um, again, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's good literature. Maybe you wouldn't read this and be like, this is great literature, it's just a page turner. Um, but for the ancient world, this is good literature and it has all of the, the pieces of good literature. Um, the plot of Judges fits in the overall arching theme of the Old Testament fairly well. It's foreshadowing to a time of the kings when the kings are terrible. It's, it, it's using the ways that the Danites went through the Holy Land in the exact same way that the Israelites went through the Holy Land in, no, in, in numbers in an effort to do all of that. Um, it's referencing things from the Old Testament before it, and it's referencing aspects that have come after it. Um, it is putting us at home in the middle of the whole story and letting us know life is terrible. And it's terrible because people aren't doing anything that they're supposed to do. They were supposed to be a covenant people. How yeah. much in these two chapters have we seen any of the actions of God? Zero. Zero, not once, not at all. So now Grace is no, I mean, nothing by this, but to see the question, does that mean that they've lost God? And the answer can be, yeah, sure they did. Is God not there? No, I mean, like, yeah, God didn't lose them. They've lost God. Yes, yes. And they're doing whatever's right in their own eyes. <sighs> and now, because of that, because they've been embracing the cultures that they weren't supposed to embrace, cultures of death, they're no longer even fighting those cultures. So you went from Othniel, who had the whole of Israel come with him, and then by the time you get into Gideon, he's fighting the Ephraimites himself afterwards. Jephthah fights them even worse. Samson doesn't have anyone who comes with him at all. In fact, the Israelites give him up to the Philistines. So you can see how they start off here in terms of things. And it's going like this. And now, you, did we even hear anything about Philistines or Moabites or Ammonites or any foreign peoples they're not supposed to interact with? No, it's from the inside. Yeah. It's all from the inside. Yeah, yeah. They don't have God anymore. They keep using the name. We, we hear, praise the Lord. Yeah. This is God. This God. They're doing the right things. I mean, do we still hear God come out of the mouths of atheists? Yeah, when they'll be like, you know, GD this or hallelujah, which of course means praise be to Yahweh. And uh, all these kind of pieces, people are saying them. We hear God's name, but we don't see God anywhere. Oh. Because they're not looking for God anywhere. And they're happy to take an idol, rob someone else of it because it's pretty. And then use it. And somehow or another, they managed to get Moses' descendants. Israel's gotten so bad that they're now attacking their own. Notice how they attack their own, too. Did they, did they spare anybody? I didn't say so. No, they annihilated them. Annihilated. And then burned it to the ground. And, 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 and Whitney, you asked, why do people do that? In the ancient world, people did that to erase any memory of the people they conquered. It was basically like ridding them in the annals of history as if they never existed. And why might we want to rid people from the annals of history as if they never existed? One is so they're never a competition for them again. So there's never a competition? Absolutely. Guilt? Might be something like guilt. Um, you certainly don't ever have to worry about paying attention to them. You don't ever have. You wipe them out 
and then you just forget. You can forget what you've done. You don't have to think about it. And you build up something new and you start saying, look at what we've done. And you have no evidence that there was someone that your people destroyed before you got there. It's like war now. It is, in fact, very similar to war now. Yeah. And the use of Moses at the end of this is demonstrating to us how bad it's gotten. Even the descendants of Moses are of no help. <clears throat> so we're done. And I didn't use my slides. <laughs> well, I didn't know we were going to take 25 minutes on the first six verses, but they were very good. And that was the first six verses of chapter 17, Kathy Brain. Yeah, we went through 18 kind of fast. Um, is, and again, I, is the reference to uh, uh, the time of captivity, is that when they were destroyed and went to Babylon? Is that? Yes. No, uh, that's the northern tribes. Uh, that was uh, the annihilation of the Assyrians or by the Assyrians. Um, Ephraim and, uh, and, and the Danites were all in the northern kingdom. And, and there is some pieces here, too, because it is northern kingdom things. That some people think this again is a, is uh, is basically propaganda for the Davidic line of the monarchy, which is the Southern Kingdom, because it's making the Northern Kingdom look bad. But it would also then be propaganda for the uh, against the way the religions of the Northern Kingdom are working above, over and against the Southern Kingdom. Yeah. Let me explain that briefly by what I mean. <laughs> Where is the, what city has the location where most people are supposed to do the cultic worship of the Israelite God? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. When Jerusalem is no longer the capital of the Northern Kingdom, the Northern Kingdom has to come up with their own holy sites. Some of their holy sites are referenced in this story and, and are basically being said in this story to say they were never of any good anyway. Um, and, uh, and they were destroyed by the Assyrians. But of course, we also know that the Southern Kingdom in Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. Babylonians. So everybody gets destroyed. And why does everybody get destroyed? Because they never learn the lesson that Judges is teaching. Them. Don't turn away from God. Don't lose God, if you will. I like that last line, but God yeah. remained in Shiloh, or the house of God remained in Shiloh. Amen. And you have that piece of things. That's where they mention the house of God. You get one little thing about the house of God being there, as opposed to the house of Micah. Next week, as I said earlier, is the worst story I know of in the Bible. And we're going to go through it and we're going to do it slowly. I, I don't mean slowly like we're going to drag it out. I mean, we're going to take time to deal with some of the emotions of this terrible story. But we should be realizing as we see what has happened. When the people are making their own idols and setting up their own ways to worship and no longer, you took my gods that I made. When we start making our own gods and even acknowledging that that's what we're doing. It's very easy to begin to rip each other apart. And next week, I think we might go slowly and look at the verbs. You ever done that when you do scripture work? Pay attention to the verbs. Because the verbs are where the action comes from, of course, right? And so we're going to pay attention to the verbs to see where things start to go wrong in the story. But there's going to be violence. And then chapters 20 and 21, after the terrible violence of 19, 
is a civil war that is bloody where one tribe, because this was just one clan of the tribe of Ephraim that was annihilated. We're gonna have a civil war where one tribe is nearly annihilated. We don't see any foreign influencers anymore. We see what happens when people embrace the cultures of death. They kill each other. I won't wax poetic about the cultures of death we still embrace. I think you can see them yourself. And as we read this book, it is a warning to us to repent, to embrace the divine again. But I'm done. Prayers and blessings. Go in peace. Know that. No, I can't even. I was about to quote what the priest Levite said to the, the Danites. Terrible me. God, forgive me. I love these people. You love them. And inspire us to love you the way that you would like to be loved so that we are the reasons that your shalom and your rest and your security might be known. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.